Chapter Seventeen of the Midnight Queen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Midnight Queen by May Agnes Fleming. Chapter Seventeen The Hidden Face. When Mr. Malcolm Ormiston, with his usual good sense and penetration, took himself off and left Leoline and Sir Norman tete a tete, his steps turned as mechanically as the needle to the North Pole toward La Masque's house. Before it he wandered, around it he wandered, like an uneasy ghost, lost in speculation about the hidden face, and fearfully impatient about the flight of time. If La Masque saw him hovering aloof and unable to tear himself away, perhaps it might touch her obdurate heart and cause her to shorten the dreary interval and summon him to her presence at once. Just then someone opened the door and his heart began to beat with anticipation. Someone pronounced his name and going over he saw the animated bag of bones, otherwise his lady loves vassal and porter. La Masque says, began the attenuated lackey, and Ormiston's heart nearly jumped out of his mouth, that she can't have anybody hanging about her house like its shadow, and she wants you to go away and keep away till the time comes she has mentioned. So saying, the skeleton shut the door, and Ormiston's heart went down to zero. There being nothing for it but obedience, however, he slowly and reluctantly turned away, feeling in his bones that, if he ever came to the bliss and ecstasy of calling La Masque Mrs. Ormiston, the gray mare in his stable would be, by long odds, the better horse. Unintentionally his steps turned to the waterside, and he descended the flight of stairs, determined to get into a boat and watch the illumination from the river. Late as was the hour, the Thames seemed alive with ferries and barges, and their numerous lights danced along the surface like fireflies over a marsh. A gay barge, gilded and cushioned, was going slowly past, and as he stood directly under the lamp, he was recognized by a gentleman within it, who leaned over and hailed him. Ormiston! I say, Ormiston! Well, my lord, said Ormiston, recognizing the handsome face and animated voice of the Earl of Rochester, have you any engagement for the next half hour? If not, do me the favor to take a seat here and watch London in flames from the river. With all my heart, said Ormiston, running down to the water's edge and leaping into the boat. With all this bustle of life around here, one would think it were noonday instead of midnight. The whole city is astir about these fires. Have you any idea they will be successful? Not the least. You know, my lord, the prediction runs that the plague will rage till the living are no longer able to bury the dead. It will soon come to that, said the earl, shuddering slightly, if it continues increasing much longer as it does now daily. How do the bills of mortality run today? I've not heard. Hark, there goes St. Paul's tolling twelve. And there goes a flash of fire, the first among many. Look, look! how they sprang up into the black darkness. They will not do it long. Look at the sky, my lord. The earl glanced up at the midnight sky of a dull and dingy red color, except where black and heavy clouds were heaving like angry billows, all dingy with smoke, and streaked with bars of fiery red. I see. There is a storm coming, and a heavy one. Our worthy burghers and most worshipful lord mayor will see their fires extinguished shortly and themselves sent home with wet jackets and for weeks almost a month there has not fallen a drop of rain remarked ormiston gravely a remarkable coincidence truly there seems to be a fatality hanging over this devoted city i wonder your lordship remains the earl shrugged his shoulders significantly it is not so easy leaving it as you think mr ormiston but I am to turn my back to it to-morrow for a brief period. You are aware, I suppose, that the court leaves before daybreak for Oxford? I believe I have heard something of it. How long to remain? Till Charles takes it into his head to come back again, said the Earl familiarly, 
which will probably be in a week or two. Look at that sky, all black and scarlet, and look at those people. I scarcely thought there were half the number left alive in London. Even the sick have come out tonight, said Armiston. Half the pest stricken in the city have left their beds full of newborn hope. One would think it were a carnival. So it is, a carnival of death. I hope, Ormiston, said the earl, looking at him with a light laugh, the pretty little white fairy we rescued from the river is not one of the sick parading the streets. Ormiston looked grave. No, my lord, I think she is not. I left her safe and secure. Who is she, Ormiston, coaxed the earl laughingly. Pshaw, man, don't make a mountain out of a molehill. Tell me her name. Her name is Leoline. What else? That is just what I would like to have someone tell me. I give you my honor, Lord, I do not know. The earl's face, half indignant, half incredulous, wholly curious, made Ormiston smile. It is a fact, my lord, I asked her her name, and she told me, Leoline, a pretty title enough, but rather unsatisfactory. How long have you known her? To the best of my belief, said Ormiston musingly, about four hours. "'Nonsense!' cried the earl energetically. "'What are you telling me, Ormiston? "'You said she was an old friend.' "'I beg your pardon, my lord. "'I said no such thing. "'I told you she had escaped from her friends, "'which was strictly true. "'Then how the demon had you the impudence "'to come up and carry her off in that style? "'I certainly had a better right to her than you, "'the right of discovery, "'and I shall call upon you to deliver her up if she belonged to me, I should only be too happy to oblige your lordship, laughed Ormiston. But she is at present the property of Sir Norman Kingsley, and to him you must apply. Ah, his inamorata, is she? Well, I must say his taste is excellent, but I should think you ought to know her name, since you and he are noted for being a modern Damon and Pythias. Probably I should, my lord, only Sir Norman, unfortunately, does not know himself. The earl's countenance looked so utterly blank at this announcement that Ormiston was forced to throw in a word of explanation. I mean to say, my lord, that he has fallen in love with her, and, judging from appearances, I should say his flame is not altogether hopeless, although they have met tonight for the first time. A rapid passion! "'Where have you left her, Ormiston?' "'In her own house, my lord,' Ormiston replied, smiling quietly to himself. "'Where is that?' "'About a dozen yards from where I stood when you called me.' "'Who are her family?' continued the earl, who seemed possessed of a devouring curiosity. "'She has none that I know of. I imagine Mistress Leoline is an orphan. I know there was not a living soul but ourselves in the house I brought her to.' "'And you left her there alone?' exclaimed the earl, half starting up, as if about to order the boatman to row back to the landing. Ormiston looked at his excited face with a glance full of quiet malice. "'No, my lord, not quite. Sir Norman Kingsley was with her.' "'Ah,' oh, said the earl, smiling back with a look of chagrin. "'Then he will probably find out her name before he comes away. "'I wonder you could give her up so easily to him after all your trouble.' "'Smitten, my lord?' inquired Ormiston maliciously. "'Hopelessly,' replied the earl with a deep sigh. "'She was a perfect little beauty, and if I can find her, "'I warn Sir Norman Kingsley to take care. "'I have already sent Hubert out in search of her, "'and, by the way,' said the earl with a sudden increase of animation, "'what a wonderful resemblance she bears to Hubert. "'I could almost swear they were one and the same.' The likeness is marvelous, but I should hate to take such an oath. I confess I am somewhat curious myself, but I stand no chance of having it gratified before tomorrow, I suppose. How those fires blaze! It is much brighter than at noonday. Show me the house in which Leoline lies. Ormiston easily pointed it out and showed the earl the light still burning in her window. It was in that room we found her first, dead of the plague. "'Dead of the what?' cried the earl, aghast. "'Dead of the plague.' "'I'll tell your lordship how it was,' said Ormiston, who forthwith commend and related the story of their finding Leoline, of the resuscitation at the plague-pit, of the flight from Sir Norman's house, 
and of the delirious plunge into the river and miraculous cure. A marvelous story, commented the earl, much interested, and Leoline seems to have as many lives as a cat. Who can she be? A princess in disguise, eh, Ormiston? She looks fit to be a princess or anything else, but your lordship knows as much about her now as I do. You say she was dressed as a bride? How came that? Simply enough. She was to be married tonight, had she not taken the plague instead. Married? Why, I thought you told me a few minutes ago she was in love with Kingsley. It seems to me, Mr. Ormiston, your remarks are a trifle inconsistent, said the earl in a tone of astonished displeasure. Nevertheless, they are all perfectly true. Mistress Leoline was to be married, as I told you, but she was to marry to please her friends and not herself. She had been in the habit of watching Kingsley go past her window, and the way she blushed and the way she went through other little motions convinces me that his course of true love will run as smoothly as this glassy river runs at present. Kingsley is a lucky fellow. Will the discarded suitor have no voice in the matter, or is he such a simpleton as to give her up at a word? Ormiston laughed. Ah, to be sure, what will the Count say? And, judging from some things I've heard, I should say he is violently in love with her. Count who? asked Rochester. Or has he, like his lady love, no other name? Oh, no, the name of the gentleman who was so nearly blessed for life and missed it is Count L'Etrange. The earl had been lying listlessly back, only half intent upon his answer, as he watched the fire, but now he sprang sharply up and stared Armiston full in the face. Count, what did you say was the eager question, while his eyes, more eager than his voice, strove to read the reply before it was repeated? Count de l'Etrange, you know him, my lord, said Ormiston quietly. Ah, said the earl, and then such a strange meaning smile went wandering about his face. I have not said that. So his name is Count l'Etrange. Well, I don't wonder now at the girl's beauty. The earl sank back to his former nonchalant position and fell for a moment or two into deep musing, and then, as if the whole thing struck him in a new and ludicrous light, he broke out into an immoderate fit of laughter. Ormiston looked at him curiously. It is my turn to ask questions now, my lord. Who is Count L'Etrange? I know of no such person, Ormiston. I was thinking of something else. Was it Leoline who told you that was her lover's name? No, I heard it by mere accident from another person. I am sure if Leoline is not a personage in disguise, he is. And why do you think so? An inward conviction, my lord. So you will not tell me who he is? Have I not told you I know of no such person as Count L'Etrange? You ought to believe me. Oh, here it comes. This last was addressed to a great drop of rain, which splashed heavily on his upturned face, followed by another and another in quick succession. The storm is upon us, said the earl, sitting up and wrapping his cloak closer around him. And I am for Whitehall. Shall we land you, Ormiston, or take you there, too? I must land, said Ormiston. I have a pressing engagement for the next half hour. Here it is, in a perfect deluge. The fires will be out in five minutes. The barge touched the stairs, and Ormiston sprang out with good night to the earl. The rain was rushing along now in torrents, and he ran upstairs and darted into an archway of the bridge to seek the shelter. Someone else had come there before him in search of the same thing, for he saw two dark figures standing within it as he entered. A sudden storm was Ormiston's salutation, and a furious one. There go the fires, hiss and splutter. I knew how it would be. Then Saul and Mr. Ormiston are among the prophets. Ormiston had heard that voice before. It was associated in his mind with a slouched hat and a shadowy cloak, and by the fast-fading flicker of the firelight he saw that both were here. The speaker, one Count L'Etrange, the figure beside him, slender and boyish, was unknown. "'You have the advantage of me, sir,' he said, affecting ignorance. "'May I ask who you are?' 
certainly a gentleman by courtesy and the grace of god and your name count l'etrange at your service ormiston lifted his cap and bowed with a feeling somehow that the count was a man in authority mr ormiston assisted in doing a good deed to-night for a friend of mine said the count will he add to that obligation by telling me if he has not discovered her again and brought her back do you refer to the fair lady in yonder house so she is there i thought so george said the count addressing himself to his companion yes i refer to her the lady you saved from the river you brought her there i brought her there replied ormiston she is there still i presume so i have heard nothing to the contrary and alone she may be now sir norman kingsley was with her when i left her said ormiston administering the fact with infinite relish there was a moment's silence ormiston could not see the count's face but judging from his own feelings he fancied its expression must be sweet the wild rush of the storm alone broke the silence until the spirit again moved the count to speak by what right does sir norman kingsley visit her he inquired in a voice betokening not the least particle of emotion by the best of rights that of her preserver hoping soon to be her lover there was another brief silence broken again by the count in the same composed tone since the lady holds her levy so late i too must have a word with her when this deluge permits one to go abroad without danger of drowning it shown symptoms of clearing off already said ormiston who in his secret heart thought it would be an excellent joke to bring the rivals face to face in the lady's presence so you will not have to wait long to which observation the count replied not and the three stood in silence watching the fury of the storm gradually it cleared away and as the moon began to straggle out between the rifts in the clouds the count saw something by her pale light that ormiston saw not that latter gentleman standing with his back to the house of leoline and his face toward that of la masque did not observe the return of sir norman from st paul's nor look after him as he rode away but the count did both and ten minutes after when the rain had entirely ceased and the moon and stars got the better of the clouds in their struggle for supremacy he beheld la masque flitting like a dark shadow in the same direction and vanishing in at leoline's door the same instant ormiston started to go the storm has entirely ceased he said stepping out and with the profound air of one making a new discovery and we are likely to have fine weather for the remainder of the night or rather morning good night count farewell said the count as he and his companion came out from the shadow of the archway and turned to follow la masque ormiston thinking the hour of waiting had elapsed and feeling much more interested in the coming meeting than in leoline and her visitors paid very little attention to his two acquaintances he saw them it is true enter leoline's house but at the same instant he took up his post at la masque's doorway and concentrated his whole attention on that piece of architecture every moment seemed like a week now and before he had stood at his post five minutes he had worked himself up into a perfect fever of impatience sometimes he was inclined to knock and seek la masque in her own home but as often the fear of a chilling rebuke paralyzed his hand when he raised it he was so sure she was within the house that he never thought of looking for her elsewhere and when at the expiration of what seemed to him a century or two but which in reality was about a quarter of an hour there was a soft rustling of drapery behind him and the sweetest of voices sounded in his ear it fairly made him bound here again mr ormiston is this the fifth or the sixth time i found you in this place to-night la masque he cried between joy and surprise but surely i was not totally unexpected this time perhaps not you are waiting here for me to redeem my promise i suppose can you doubt it since i knew you first i have desired this hour as the blind desire sight ah uh, and you will find it as sweet to look back upon as you have to look forward to said la masque derisively if you are wise for yourself mr ormiston you will pause here and give me back that fatal word 
Never, madame, and surely you will not be so piteously cruel as to draw back now. No, I have promised, and I shall perform, and let the consequences be what they may. They will rest upon your own head. You have been warned, and you still insist. I still insist. Then let us move farther over there into the shadow of the houses. This moonlight is so dreadfully bright. They moved on into the deep shadow, and there was a pulse throbbing in Ormiston's head and heart like the beating of a muffled drum. They paused and faced each other silently. "'Quick, madame!' cried Ormiston, hoarsely, his whole face flushed wildly. His strange companion lifted her hand as if to remove the mask, and he saw that it shook like an aspen. She made one motion as though about to lift it, and then recoiled as if from herself in a sort of horror." "'My God, what is this man urging me to do? "'How can I ever fulfill that fatal promise?' "'Madame, you torture me,' said Ormiston, "'whose face showed what he felt. "'You must keep your promise, "'so do not drive me wild waiting. "'Let me—' "'He took a step toward her as to lift the mask himself, "'but she held out both arms to keep him off. "'No, no, no, come not near me, Malcolm Ormiston. "'Fated man!' Since you will rush on your doom, look, and let the sight blast you if it will. She unfastened her mask, raised it, and with it the profusion of long, sweeping black hair, Ormiston did look, in much the same way, perhaps, that Zulinka looked at the veiled prophet. The next moment there was a terrible cry, and he fell headlong with a crash, as if a bullet had whined through his heart. End of chapter 17。Eighteen of the Midnight Queen。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. The Midnight Queen by May Agnes Fleming. Chapter 18. The Interview. I am not aware whether fainting was as much the fashion among the fair sex, in the days, or rather the nights, of which I have the honour to hold forth, as at the present time, but I am inclined to think not, from the simple fact that Leoline, though like John Bunyan, grievously troubled and tossed about in her mind, did nothing of the kind. For the first few moments she was altogether too stunned by the suddenness of the shock to cry out or make the least resistance and was conscious of nothing but of being rapidly borne along in somebody's arms. When this hazy view of things passed away, her new sensation was the intensely uncomfortable one of being on the verge of suffocation. She made one frantic but futile effort to free herself and scream for help, but the strong arms held her with most loving tightness, and her cry was drowned in the hot atmosphere within the shawl, and never passed beyond it. Most assuredly, Leoline would have been smothered then and there, had their journey been much longer. But fortunately for her, it was only the few yards between her house and the river. She knew she was then carried down some steps, and she heard the dip of the oars in the water. And then her bearer paused, and went through a short dialogue with somebody else. With Count Lestrong, she rather felt than knew, for nothing was audible but a low murmur. The only word she could make out was a low, emphatic, remember, in the Count's voice, and then she knew she was in a boat, and that it was shoved off and moving down the rapid river. The feeling of heat and suffocation was dreadful, and as her abductor placed her on some cushions, she made another desperate but feeble effort to free herself from the smothering shawl. But a hand was laid lightly on hers, and a voice interposed. Lady, it is quite useless for you to struggle, as you are irrevocably in my power. But if you will promise faithfully not to make an outcry, and will submit to be blindfolded, I shall remove this oppressive muffling from your head. Tell me if you will promise. He had partly raised the shawl, and a gush of free air came revivingly in, and enabled Leoline to gasp out a faint, I promise. As she spoke it, it was lifted off altogether and she caught one bright fleeting glimpse of the river, sparkling and silvery in the moonlight, of the bright blue sky, 
gemmed with countless stars, and of some one by her side in the dress of a court page, whose face was perfectly unknown to her. The next instant a bandage was bound tightly over her eyes, excluding every ray of light, while the strange voice again spoke apologetically. "'Pardon, lady, but it is my orders. I am commanded to treat you with every respect, but not to let you see where you are born to.' "'But what right does Count Lestrange have to commit this outrage?' began Leoline, almost as imperiously as Miranda herself, and making use of her tongue, like a true woman, the very first moment it was at her disposal. "'How dare he carry me off in this atrocious way! Whoever you are, sir, if you have the spirit of a man, you will bring me directly back to my own house.' "'I am very sorry, lady, but I have received orders that must be obeyed. You must come with me. But you need fear nothing. You will be as safe and secure as in your own home. Secure enough, no doubt, said Leoline bitterly. I never did like Count Lestrange, but I never knew he was a coward and a villain till now. Her companion made no reply to this forcible address, and there was a moment's indignant silence on Leoline's part, broken only by the dip of the oars and the rippling of the water. Then, "'Will you not tell me, at least, where you are taking me to?' haughtily demanded Leoline. "'Lady, I cannot. It was to prevent you knowing that you have been blindfolded.' "'Oh, your master has a faithful servant, I see. How long am I to be kept a prisoner?' "'I do not know.' "'Where is Count Lestrange?' "'I cannot tell.' "'Where am I to see him?' I cannot say. Ha! Huh, said Leoline, with infinite contempt, and turning her back upon him she relapsed into gloomy silence. It had all been so sudden, and had taken her so much by surprise, that she had not had time to think of the consequences until now. But now they came upon her with a rush, and with dismal distinctness. The most distinct among all was, what would Sir Norman say? Of course, with all a lover's impatience, he would be at his post by sunrise, would come to look for his bride, and would find himself cold. By that time she would be far enough away, perhaps a melancholy corpse, and at this dreary passage in her meditations, Leoline sighed profoundly. And he would never know what had become of her, or how much and how long she had loved him. And this hateful Count Lestrange, what did he intend to do with her? perhaps go so far as to make her marry him, and imprison her with the rest of his wives, for Leoline was prepared to think the very worst of the Count, and had not the slightest doubt that he had already a harem full of abducted wives, somewhere. But no, he never could do that. He might do what he liked with weaker minds, but she never would be a bride of his, while the plague or poison was to be had in London." and with this invincible determination rooted fixedly, not to say obstinately, in her mind, she was nearly pitched overboard by the boat suddenly landing at some unexpected place. A little natural scream of terror was repressed on her lips by a hand being placed over them, and the determined but perfectly respectful tones of the person beside her speaking. "'Remember your promise, lady, and do not make a noise. We have arrived at our journey's end.' and if you will take my arm, I will lead you along, instead of carrying you. Leoline was rather surprised to find the journey so short, but she arose directly, with silence and dignity, at least with as much of the latter commodity as could be reasonably expected, considering that boats on water are rather unsteady things to be dignified in, and was led gently, and with care, out of the swaying vessel, and up another flight of stairs. Then, in a few moments, she was conscious of passing from the free night air into the closer atmosphere of a house, and in going through an endless labyrinth of corridors and passages and suites of rooms and flights of stairs, until she became so extremely tired that she stopped with spirited abruptness, and in the plainest possible English gave her conductor to understand that they had gone about far enough for all practical purposes." to which that patient and respectful individual replied that he was glad to inform her that they had but a few more steps to go, which the next moment proved to be true, for he stopped and announced that their promenade was over for the night. 
"'And I suppose I may have the use of my eyes at last?' inquired Leoline, with more haughtiness than Sir Norman could have believed possible so gentle a voice could have expressed. For reply, her companion rapidly untied the bandage, and withdrew it with a flourish. The dazzling brightness that burst upon her so blinded her that for a moment she could distinguish nothing and when she looked round to contemplate her companion, she found him hurriedly making his exit, and securely locking the door. The sound of the key turning in the lock gave her a most peculiar sensation, which none but those who have experienced it can properly understand. It is not the most comfortable feeling in the world to know you are a prisoner, even if you have no key turned upon you but the weather, and your jailer be a high east wind and lashing rain. Leoline's prison and jailer were something worse, and, for the first time, a chill of fear and dismay crept icily to the core of her heart. But Leoline had something of Miranda's courage, as well as her looks and temper, so she tried to feel as brave as possible, and not to think of her unpleasant predicament while there remained anything else to think about. Perhaps she might escape, too, and as this notion struck her, she looked with eager anxiety, not unmixed with curiosity, at the place where she was. By this time her eyes had been accustomed to the light, which proceeded from a great antique lamp of bronze, pendant by a brass chain from the ceiling, and she saw she was in a moderately sized and by no means splendid room. But what struck her most was that everything had a look of age about it, from the glittering oak beams of the floor to the faded ghostly hangings on the wall. There was a bed at one end, a great spectral arc of a thing, like a mausoleum, with drapery as old and spectral as that on the walls, and in which she no more could have lain than in a moth-eaten shroud. The seats and the one table the room held were of the same ancient and weird pattern, and the sight of them gave her a shivering sensation, not unlike an og chill. There was but one door, a huge structure, with shining panels, securely locked, and escape from that quarter was utterly out of the question. There was one window, hung with dark curtains of tarnished embroidery, but in pushing them aside she met only a dull blank of unlighted glass, for the shutters were firmly secured without. Altogether she could not form the slightest idea where she was, and with a feeling of utter despair she sat down on one of the queer old chairs with much the same feeling as if she were sitting on a tomb. What would Sir Norman say? Would he ever think of her when he found her gone? And what was destined to be her fate in this dreadful out-of-the-way place? She would have cried, as most of her sex would be tempted to do in such a situation, but that her dislike and horror of Count Lestrange was a good deal stronger than her grief, and turned her tears to sparks of indignant fire. Never! Never, never would she be his wife. He might kill her a thousand times if he liked, and she wouldn't yield an inch. She did not mind dying in a good cause. She could do it but once. And with Sir Norman despising her, as she felt he must do, when he found her run away, she rather liked the idea than otherwise. Mentally she bade adieu to all her friends before beginning to prepare for her melancholy fate. To her handsome lover— to his gallant friend Amistron, to her poor nurse Prudence, and to her mysterious visitor La Masque. La Masque, ah, that name awoke a new chord of recollection. The casket, she had it with her yet. Instantly, everything was forgotten but it and its contents, and she placed a chair directly under the lamp, drew it out, and looked at it. It was a pretty little billet itself with its polished ivory surface and shining clasps of silver. But the inside had far more interest for her than the outside, and she fitted the key and unlocked it with a trembling hand. It was lined with azure velvet, wrought with silver thread, in dainty wreaths of water-lilies, and in the bottom, neatly folded, lay a sheet of fool's cap. She opened it with nervous haste. It was a common sheet enough, stamped with a fool's cap and bells, that showed it belonged to Cromwell's time. It was closely written, in a light, fair hand, and bore the title, Leoline's History. 
Leoline's hand trembled so with eagerness that she could scarcely hold the paper, but her eye rapidly ran from line to line, and she stopped not till she reached the end. While she read, her face alternatively flushed and paled, her eyes dilated, her lips parted, and before she finished it there came over all a look of the most unutterable horror. It dropped from her powerless fingers as she finished, and she sank back in her chair with such a ghastly paleness that it seemed absolutely like the lividness of death. A sudden and startling noise awoke her from her trance of horror. Someone trying to get in at the window. The chill of terror it sent through every vein acted as a sort of counter-irritant to the other feeling, and she sprang from her chair and turned her face fearfully toward the sounds. But in all her terror she did not forget the mysterious sheet of foolscap, which lay, looking up at her, on the floor, and she snatched it up and thrust it and the casket out of sight. Still the sounds went on, but softly and cautiously, and at intervals, as if the worker were afraid of being heard. Leoline went back, step by step, to the other extremity of the room, with her eyes still fixed on the window, and on her face a white terror that left her perfectly colorless. Who could it be? Not Count Lestrong, for he would surely not need to enter his own house like a burglar. Not Sir Norman Kingsley, for he could certainly not find out about her abduction and her prison so soon, and she had no other friends in the whole wide world to trouble themselves about her. There was one, but the idea of ever seeing her again was so unspeakably dreadful that she would rather have seen the most horrible spectre her imagination could conjure up than that tall, graceful, rich-robed form. Still, the noises perseveringly continued. There was a sound of withdrawing bolts, and then a pale ray of moonlight shot between the parted curtains, showing the shutters had been opened. Whiter and whiter Leoline grew, and she felt herself growing cold and rigid with mortal fear. Softly the window was raised, a hand stole in and parted the curtains, and a pale face and two great dark eyes wandered slowly round the room, and rested at last on her, standing, like a galvanized corpse, as far from the window as the wall would permit. The hand was lifted in a warning gesture, as if to enforce silence. The window was raised still higher. A figure, lithe and agile as a cat, sprang lightly into the room, and standing with his back to her, reclosed the shutters, reshut the window, and redrew the curtains, before taking the trouble to turn round. This discreet little maneuver, which showed her visitor was human, and gifted with human prudence, reassured Leoline a little, and, to judge by the reverse of the metal, the nocturnal intruder was nothing very formidable after all. But the stranger did not keep her long in suspense. While she stood gazing at him, as if fascinated, he turned round, stepped forward, took off his cap, and made her a courtly bow, and then straightening himself up, prepared with great coolness to scrutinize and be scrutinized. Well might they look at each other, for the two faces were perfectly the same, and each one saw himself and herself as others saw them. There was the same coal-black, curling hair, the same lustrous eyes, the same clear, colorless complexion, the same delicate, perfect features. Nothing was different but the costume and the expression. The latter was essentially different, for the young ladies betrayed amazement, terror, doubt, and delight all at once, while the young gentleman's was a grand, careless surprise, mixed with just a dash of curiosity. He was the first to speak, and after they had stared at each other for the space of five minutes, he described a graceful sweep with his hand, and held forth in the following strain. "'I greatly fear, fair Leoline, that I have startled you by my sudden and surprising entrance, and if I have been the cause of a moment's alarm to one so perfectly beautiful, I shall hate myself for ever after. If I could have got in any other way, rest assured I would not have risked my neck and your peace of mind by such a suspicious means of ingress as the window. But if you will take the trouble to notice, the door is thick, and I am composed of too solid flesh to whisk through the keyhole, so I had to make my appearance the best way I could. Who are you? 
faintly asked Leoline. "'Your friend, fair lady, and Sir Norman Kingsley's.' Hubert looked to see Leoline start and blush, and was deeply gratified to see her do both, and her whole pretty countenance became alive with new-born hope, as if that name were a magic talisman of freedom and joy. "'What is your name, and who are you?' she inquired in a breathless sort of way, that made Hubert look at her a moment in calm astonishment. "'I have told you, your friend, christened at some remote period, Hubert. For further particulars, apply to the Earl of Rochester, whose page I am.' "'The Earl of Rochester's page,' she repeated in the same quick, excited way, that surprised and rather lowered her in that good youth's opinion, for giving way to any feelings so plebeian. "'It is. It must be the same.' "'I have no doubt of it,' said Hubert. "'The same what?' "'Did you not come from France, from Dion, recently?' went on Leoline, rather inoppositely, as it struck her hearer. "'Certainly I come from Dion. Had I the honour of being known to you there?' "'How strange! How wonderful!' said Leoline, with a paling cheek and quickened breathing. "'How mysterious these things turn out! I thank heaven that I have found some one to love at last!' This speech, which was Greek, algebra, high Dutch or thereabouts, to Master Hubert, caused him to stare to such an extent that when he came to think of it afterward, positively shocked him. The two great, wondering dark eyes transfixing her with so much amazement brought Leoline to a sense of her talking unfathomable mysteries, quite incomprehensible to her handsome auditor. She looked at him with a smile, held out her hand, and Hubert received a strange little electric thrill, to see that her eyes were full of tears. He took the hand and raised it to his lips, wondering if the young lady, struck by his good looks, had conceived a rash and inordinate attack of love at first sight, and was about to offer herself to him, and discard Sir Norman for ever. From this speculation the sweet voice aroused him. "'You have told me who you are. Now, do you know who I am?' I hope so, fairest Leoline. I know you are the most beautiful lady in England, and to-morrow will be called Lady Kingsley. I am something more, said Leoline, holding his hand between hers and bending near him. I am your sister. The Earl of Rochester's page must have had good blood in his veins, for never was there duke, grandee, or peer of the realm more radically and unaffectedly nonchalant than he. To this unexpected announcement he listened with most dignified and well-bred composure, and in his secret heart, or rather vanity, more disappointed than otherwise to find his first solution of her tenderness a great mistake. Leoline held his hand tight in hers, and looked with loving and tearful eyes in his face. "'Dear Hubert, you are my brother, my long unknown brother, and I love you with my whole heart.' "'Am I?' said Hubert. "'I dare say I am, for they all say we look as much alike as two peas. I am excessively delighted to hear it, and to know that you love me. Permit me to embrace my new relative.' With which the court page kissed Leoline with emphasis, while she scarcely knew whether to laugh, cry, or be provoked at his composure. On the whole she did a little of all three, and pushed him away with a half-pout. "'You insensible mortal!' How can you stand there and hear that you have found a sister with so much indifference? Indifferent? Not I. You have no idea how wildly excited I am, said Hubert, in a voice not betokening the slightest emotion. How did you find it out, Leoline? Never mind. I shall tell you that again. You don't doubt it, I hope. Of course not. I knew from the first moment I set eyes on you, that if you were not my sister, you ought to be. I wish you'd tell me all the particulars, Leoline. I shall do so as soon as I am out of this, but how can I tell you anything here? That's true, said Hubert, reflectively. Well, I'll wait. Now, don't you wonder how I found you out and came here? Indeed I do. How was it, Hubert? Oh, well, I don't know as I can altogether tell you, but you see— Sir Norman Kingsley, being possessed of an inspiration that something was happening to you, came to your house a short time ago, and, as he suspected, discovered that you were missing. I met him there, 
rather depressed in his mind about it, and he told me, beginning the conversation, I must say, in a very excited manner, said Hubert, parenthetically, as memory recalled the furious shaking he had undergone, and he told me he fancied you were abducted, and by one Count Lestrong. Now I had a hazy idea who Count Lestrong was, and where he would be most apt to take you to, and so I came here, and after some searching, more inquiring, and a few unmitigated falsehoods, you'll regret to hear, discovered you were locked up in this place, and succeeded in getting in through the window. Sir Norman is waiting for me in a state of distraction, so now, having found you, I will go and relieve his mind by reporting accordingly. "'And leave me here?' cried Leoline, in a fright. "'And in the power of Count Lestrand? Oh, no, no, you must take me with you, Hubert.' "'My dear Leoline, it is quite impossible to do it without help, and without a ladder. I will return to Sir Norman, and when the darkness comes that precedes day dawn, we will raise the ladder to your window and try to get you out. Be patient. Only wait an hour or two, and then you will be free. But, oh, Hubert, where am I? What dreadful place is this? Why, I do not know that this is a very dreadful place, and most people consider it a sufficiently respectable house. But still, I would rather see my sister anywhere else than in it, and will take the trouble of kidnapping her out of it as quickly as possible. But, Hubert, tell me, do tell me, who is Count Lestrong? Hubert laughed. Cannot, really, Leoline, at least not until tomorrow, and you are Lady Kingsley. But what if he should come here to-night? I do not think there is much danger of that, but whether he does or not, rest assured, you shall be free to-morrow, and at all events, it is quite impossible for you to escape with me now, and even as it is, I run the risk of being detected and made a prisoner myself. You must be patient and wait, Leoline, and trust to Providence, and your brother Hubert. I must, I suppose, said Leoline, sighing and you cannot take me away until day-dawn? Quite impossible, and then all this drapery of yours will be ever so much in the way. Would you object to garments like these, pointing to his doublet and hose? If you would not, I think I could procure you a fit-out. But I should, though, said Leoline, with spirit, and most decidedly, too. I shall wear nothing of the kind, Sir Page. Every one to her fancy, said Hubert, with a French shrug and my pretty sister shall have hers, in spite of earth, air, fire, and water. And now, fair Leoline, for a brief time, adieu, and au revoir. "'You will not fail me,' exclaimed Leoline, earnestly clasping her hands. "'If I do, it shall be the last thing I will fail on earth, for if I am alive by to-morrow morning, Leoline shall be free.' "'And you will be careful. You will both be careful.' excessively careful. Now then. The last two words were addressed to the window, which he noiselessly opened as he spoke. Leoline caught a glimpse of the bright, free moonlight, and watched him with desperate envy, but the next moment the shutters were closed, and Hubert and the moonlight were both gone. End of chapter 18「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」「ジャイアンの恋人」The livid face, upturned to the moonlight, was unmistakably the face of a dead man. It was no swoon, no deception like Leoline's, for the blue, ghastly paleness that marks the flight of the soul from the body was stamped on every rigid feature. Yet Sir Norman could not realise it. We all know how hard it is to realise the death of a friend from whom we have but lately parted in full health and life, and Ormiston's death was so sudden. Why, it was not quite two hours since they had parted in Leoline's house, and even the plague could not carry off a victim as quickly as this. Ormiston, Ormiston, he called, between grief and dismay, as he raised him in his arms, 
with his hand over the stilled heart. But Ochmiston answered not, and the heart gave no pulsation beneath his fingers. He tore open the doublet, as the thought of the plague flashed through his mind, but no plague spot was to be seen, and it was quite evident from the appearance of the face that he had not died of the distemper, neither was there any wound or mark to show that he had met his end violently. Yet the cold white face was convulsed, as if he had died in throes of agony, and the hands were clenched till the nails sank into the flesh, and that was the only outward sign or token that he had suffered in expiring. Sir Norman was completely at a lose, and half beside himself, with a thousand conflicting feelings of sorrow, astonishment, and mystification. The rapid and exciting events of the night had turned his head into a mental chaos, as they were very well might, but he still had common sense and enough left to know that something must be done about this immediately. He knew the best place to take Ormiston was the nearest apothecary shop, which establishments were generally open, and filled the whole live-long night by the sick and their friends. As he was meditating whether not to call the surly watchman to help him carry the body, a pest cart came providentially along, and the driver seeing a young man bending over a prostrate form guessed at once what was the master, and came to a halt. "'Another one,' he said, coming leisurely up and glancing at the lifeless form with a very professional eye. Well, I think there is room for another one on a cart, so bear a hand, friend, and let us have him out of this. You are mistaken, said Sir Norman sharply. He has not died of the plague. I am not even certain whether he is dead at all. The driver looked at Sir Norman, then stooped down and touched Ochmiston's icy face, and listened to him breathe. He stood up after a moment, with something like a small laugh. If he's alive, he said, turning to go, then I never saw anyone dead. Good night, sir. I wish you joy when you bring him to. Stay, exclaimed the young man. I wish you to assist me in bringing him to yonder apothecary's shop, and you may have this for your pains. This proved to be a talisman of alacrity, for the man pocketed it and briskly laid hold of Ormiston by the feet, while Sir Norman wrapped his cloak reverently about him and took him by the shoulders. In this style, his body was conveyed to the apothecary's shop, which they found half full of applicants for medicine, among whom their entrance with the corpse produced no greater sensation than a momentary stare. The attire and bearing of Sir Norman, proving him to be something different from their usual class of visitors, bringing one of the drowsy apprentices immediately to his side, inquiring what were his orders. A private room and your master's attendance directly, was the authoritative reply. Both were to be had, the former a hole in the wall behind the shop, the latter a pallid, cadaverous-looking person, with the air of one who had been dead a week, thought better of it and rose again. There was a long table in the aforesaid hole in the wall, bearing a strong family likeness to a dissecting table, upon which the stark figure was laid and the pest cart driver disappeared. The apothecary held a mirror close to the face, applied his ear to the pulse and heart, held a pocket mirror over his mouth, looked at it, shook his head, and set down the candle with decision. The man is dead, sir, was his criticism. Dead as a doornail. All the medicine in the shop wouldn't kindle one spark of life in such ashes. At least try. Try something. Bleeding, for instance, suggested Sir Norman. Again the apothecary examined the body, and again he shook his head dolefully. It is no use, sir, but if it will please you, you can try. The right arm was bared, the lancet inserted. One or two black drops sluggishly followed, and nothing more. "'It's all the waste of time, you see,' remarked the apothecary, wiping his dreadful little weapon. "'He's as dead as ever I saw anybody in my life. How did he come to his end, sir? Not by the plague?' "'I don't know,' said Sir Norman gloomily. "'I wish you would tell me that.' "'Can't do it, sir. My skill doesn't extend that far.' There is no plague spot or visible wound or bruise to the person, so he must have died of some internal complaint, probably disease of the heart. Never knew him to have such a thing, said Sir Norman, sighing. It is very mysterious and very dreadful, and notwithstanding all you have said, I cannot believe him dead. Can he not remain here until morning at least? The starved apothecary looked at him out of the pair of hollow, melancholy eyes. Gold can do anything was his plaintive reply. I understand. You shall have it. 
Are you sure you can do nothing more for him? Nothing whatever, sir. And excuse me, but there are customers in the shop, and I must leave, sir. Which he did accordingly, and Sir Num was left alone with all that remained of him, who, two hours before, was his warm friend. He could scarcely believe that it was the calm majesty of death that had so changed the expression of the white face, and yet the longer he looked, the more deeply an inward conviction assured him that it was so. He chafed the chilling hands and face, he applied heart shorn and burnt feathers to the nostrils, but all these applications, though excellent in their way, could not exactly raise the dead to life, and, in this case, proved a signal failure. He gave up his doctoring, at least in despair, and folding his arms, looked down at what lay on the table, and tried to convince himself there was Orgniston. So absorbed was he in the endeavour that he heeded not the passing moments, until it struck him with a shock that Hubert might even now be waiting for him in the trysting place, with news of Leoline. Love is stronger than friendship, stronger than grief, stronger than death, stronger than any other feeling in the world. So he suddenly seized his hat, turned his back on Normiston and the apothecary's shop, and strode off to the place he had quitted. No Hubert was there, but two figures were passing slowly along in the moonlight, and one of them he recognised, with an impulse to spring at him like a tiger and strangle him. But he had been so shocked and subdued by his recent discovery, that the impulse which, half an hour before, would have been unhesitatingly obeyed, went for nothing now and there was more of a reproach, even, than anger in his voice, as he went over and laid his hand on the shoulder of one of them. Stay, he said, one word with you, Comte Lestrange. What have you done with Leoline? Ah, Sir Norman, as I live, cried the Count, wheeling round and lifting his hat. Give me good evening, or rather good morning, Kingsley, for St. Paul's has long gone the midnight hour. Sir Norman, with his hand still in his shoulder, returned not the courtesy, and regarding the gallant Count with a stern eye. "'Where is Leoline? he frigidly replied. "'Really?' said the Count, with some embarrassment. "'You attack me so unexpectedly, and so like a ghost or a highwayman. "'By the way, I have a word to say to you about highwaymen, and was seeking you to say it.' "'Where is Leoline?' he shouted the exasperated young knight, releasing his shoulder and clutching him by the throat. "'Tell me all by heaven. I'll pitch you neck and heels to the Thames.' Instantly the sword of the Count's companion flashed in the moonlight, and, in two seconds more, its blue blade would have ended the earthly career of Sir Norman's Kingsley, had not the Count quickly sprang back and made a motion for his companion to hold. "'Wait!' he cried commandingly, with his arm outstretched to each. "'Keep off! George, sheath your sword and stand aside. Sir Norman Kingsley, one word with you, and be it in peace.' "'There can be no peace between us,' replied the aggravated young gentleman fiercely. "'Until you tell me what has become of Leoline. "'All in good time. We have a listener, and does it not strike you our conference should be private? "'Public or private, it matters a jot, so that you tell me what you have done with Leoline,' replied Sir Norman." with whom it was evident getting beyond this question was a moral and physical impossibility and if you do not give an account of yourself and run you through as sure as your name is count l'estrange a strange sort of smile came over the face of the count at this direful threat as if he fancied in that case he was safe enough but sir norman luckily did not see it and heard only the suave reply certainly sir norman i shall be delighted to do so let us stand over there in the shadow of that arch, and George, do you remain here within call? The Count blandly waved Sir Norman to follow, which Sir Norman did, with much the mien of a sulky lion, and a moment after both were, f were facing each other in the archway. Well, cried the young knight impatiently, I'm waiting. Go on. My dear Kingsley, responded the Count in his easy way, I think you are labouring under a little mistake. I have nothing to go on about. It is you who are to begin the controversy. Do you dare to play with me? exclaimed Sir Norman furiously. I tell you to take care how you speak. What have you done with Leoline? That is the fourth or fifth time that you've asked me that question, said the Count with provoking indifference. What do you imagine I have done with her? Sir Norman's feelings, which had been rising ever since their meeting, got up to such a height at this aggravating question, that he gave vent to an oath and laid his hand on his sword, but the Count's hand lightly interposed before it came out. 
Not yet, Sir Norman. Be calm. Talk rationally. What do you accuse me of doing with Leoline? Do you dare deny having carried her off? Deny it? No. I am never afraid to father my own deeds. Ah! said Sir Norman, grinding his teeth. Then you acknowledge it. I acknowledge it? Yes. What next? The perfect composure of his tone fell like a cool, damp towel on the fire of Sir Norman's wrath. It did not quite extinguish the flame, however, only quenched it a little, and it still hissed hotly underneath. "'And you dare to stand before me and acknowledge such an act?' exclaimed Sir Norman, perfectly astounded at the cool assurance of the man. "'Verily, yes,' said the Count, laughing. "'I seldom take the trouble to deny my acts. What next?' "'There is nothing next,' said Sir Norman severely, "'until we have come to a proper understanding about this. "'Are you aware, sir, that that lady is my promised bride?' "'No, I do not know that I am. "'On the contrary, I have an idea she is mine.' "'She was, you mean, and now she she was forced into consenting by yourself and her nurse. "'Still, she consented, and a bond is a bond, and a promise is a promise, all the world over.' "'Not with a woman,' said Sir Norman, with a stern dogmatism. "'It is their privilege to break their promise, and change their minds sixty times an hour if they choose. "'Leoline has seen fit to do both, and has accepted me in your stead. "'Therefore I command you instantly give her up.' "'Softly, my friends, softly. How was I to know all this?' "'You ought to have known it,' returned Sir Norman, in the same dogmatical way. "'Or if you didn't, you do now. So say no more about it. "'Where is she, I tell you?' repeated the young man, in a frenzy. "'Your patience one moment longer, until we see which of us has the best right to the lady. "'I have a prior claim.' A forced one, Leoline does not care a snap for you, and she loves me. What extraordinary bad taste, said the Count thoughtfully. Did she tell you that? Yes, she did tell me this, and a great deal more. Come, have done talking and tell me where she is, or I'll— Oh, no, you wouldn't, said the Count teasingly. Since matters stand in this light, I'll tell you what I'll do. I acknowledge that I carried off Leoline viewing her as my promised bride and have sent her to my own home in the care of a trusty messenger where i give you my word of honour i have not been since she is as safe there and much safer in, than in her own house until morning and it would be a pity to disturb her at this unreasonable hour when the morning comes we will both go to her state our rival claims and whichever one she decides on accepting can have her and end the matter at once the Count paused and meditated. This proposal was all very plausible and nice on the surface, but Sir Nun, with his usual penetration and acuteness, looked further than the surface and found a flaw. "'And how am I to know,' he said doubtingly, "'that you will not go to her to-night, and spirit her off where I will never hear of either of you again? "'In the very best way in the world, we will not part company until morning comes.' "'Are we at peace?' inquired the Count, smiling and holding out the hand. "'Until then we will have to be, I suppose,' replied Sir Norman, rather ungraciously taking the hand, as if it were red-hot, and dropping it again. "'And we are to stand here and rail at each other in the meantime. Even the most sublime prospect tires when surveyed too long. There is a little excursion which I would like you to accompany me on, if you have no objection. "'Where to?' "'To the ruin, where you have already been twice to-night.' Sir Norman stared. And who told you this fact, Sir Count? Never mind, I have heard it. Would you object to a third excursion there before morning? Again Sir Norman paused and meditated. There was no use in staying where he was. That would bring him no near to Leoline. And nothing was to be gained by killing the Count beyond the mere transitory pleasure of the thing. On the other hand, he has an intense and ardent desire to revisit the ruin and learn what had become of Miranda. The only drawback being that if they were found, they would both be most assuredly beheaded. Then again, there was Hubert. Well, inquired the Count, as Sir Norman looked up. I have no objection to go with you to the Rhone, was the reply. Only this. If we are seen there, we will be dead men two minutes after, and I have no desire to depart this life until I promise that promised interview with Leoline. I have the thought of that, said the Count. We have provided for it. We may venture into the lion's den without the slightest danger. 
all that is required being your promise to guide us thither. Do you give it? I do, but I expect a friend here shortly, and I cannot start until he comes. If you mean me by that, I am here, said a voice at his elbow, and the keen round he saw Hubert himself, standing there, a quiet listener and spectator of the scene. Gourny Strange looked at him with interest, and Hubert, affecting not to notice the survey, watched Sir Norman. Well, was that individual's eager address. Were you successful? The Count was still watching the boy so intently that that most discreet youth was suddenly seized with a violent fit of coughing which precluded all possibility of reply for at least five minutes, and Sir Norman, at the same moment, felt his arm receive a sharp and warning pinch. "'Is this your friend?' said the Count. "'He's a very small one, and seems in a bad state of health.' Sir Norman, still under the influence of the pinch, replied by an audible murmur, and looked with a deeply mystified expression at Hubert. "'He bears a strong resemblance to the lady we were talking of a moment ago,' continued the Count is sufficiently like her, in fact, to be her brother, and, I see wares of the livery of the Earl of Rochester. God spare you your eyesight, said Sir Norman impatiently. Can you not see, among the rest, that I have a few words to say to him in private? Permit us to leave you for a moment. There is no need to do so. I will leave you, as I have a few words to say to the person who is with me. So saying, the Count walked away, and Hubert followed with him a most curious look. Now, cried Sir Norman eagerly, what news? Good, said the boy. Leoline is safe, and where? Not far from here. Didn't he tell you? The Count, no. Yes, he said she was at his house. Exactly, that is where she is, said Hubert, looking much relieved, and at present perfectly safe. And did you see her? Of course, and heard her too. She was dreadfully anxious to come with me, but that was out of the question. And how was she to be got away? That I do not clearly see. We will have to bring a ladder, and there will be so much danger and so little chance of success that, to me, it seems an almost hopeless task. Where did you meet Count Lestrange? Here, and he told me that he had abducted her and held her a prisoner in his own house. He owned to that, did he? I wonder if you were not fit to kill him. So I was at first, but you talked the matter over somehow. And hereupon Sir Norman briefly and quickly rehearsed the substance of their conversation. Hubert listened to it attentively, and laughed as he concluded. "'Well, I do not see that you can do otherwise, Sir Norman, and I think it would be wise to obey the Count for to-night, at least. Then to-morrow, if things do not go on well, we can take the law in our own hands.' "'Can we?' said the N Sir Norman doubtfully. "'I do wish you would tell me who this infernal Count is, Hubert, but I am certain you know. "'Not until to-morrow. You shall know him then.' "'To-morrow? To-morrow?' exclaimed Sir Norman, disconsolately. Everything is postponed until tomorrow. Oh, here comes the Count back again. Are we going to start now, I wonder? Is your friend to accompany us on our expedition? inquired the Count, standing before them. It shall be quite easy, as you say, Mr. Kingsley. My friend can do as he pleases. What do you say, Hubert? I should like to go, of all things, if neither of you any objections. Come on, then, said the Count. We will find horses in readiness a short distance from this. The three started together and walked on in silence through several streets until they reached a retired inn, where the Count's recent companion stood with the horses. The Count Lestrange whispered a few words to him, upon which he bowed and retired, and in an instant they were all in the saddle and galloping away. The journey was rather a startling one, and what conversation there was was principally sustained by the Count. Hubert's usual flow of pertinent chat seemed to have forsaken him, and Sir Norman had so many other things to think of, Leoline, Ormiston, Miranda, and the mysterious Count himself, that he felt in no mood for talking. Soon they had left the city behind them, the succeeding two miles were quickly passed over, and the golden crown, all dark and forsaken, now hove in sight. As they reached this and cantered up the road leading to the ruin, Sir Norman drew rein and said, I think our best plan would be to dismount and lead our horses the rest of the way, and not incur any unnecessary danger by making a noise. We can fasten them to these trees, where they will be at hand when we come out. Wait one moment, said the Count, lifting his finger with a listening look. Listen to that! It was a regular tramp of horses' hooves, sounding the silence like a charge of cavalry. While they looked, a troop of horsemen came galloping up and came to a halt when they saw the Count. No words can depict the look of amazement Sir Norman's face wore, but Hubert 
betrayed not the least surprise. The Count glanced at his companions with a significant smile, and riding back, held a brief colloquy with him, who seemed the leader of the horsemen. He rode up to them, smiling and saying as he passed, Now then, Kingsley, lead on, and we will follow. I go not one step further, said Sir Norman firmly, until I know who I am leading. Who are you, Count Lestrange? The Count looked at him, but did not answer. A warning hand, that of Hubert, grasped Sir Norman's arm, and Hubert's voice whispered hurriedly in his ear, Hush, for God's sake, it is the King! End of chapter 19 Recording by Grace Dobson Chapter 20 of The Midnight Queen This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Midnight Queen by Mary Agnes Fleming. Chapter 20. At the Plague Pit. The effect of the whisper was magical. Everything that had been dark before became clear as noonday and Sir Norman sat absolutely astounded at his own stupidity in not having found it out for himself before. Every feature, notwithstanding the disguise of wig and beard, became perfectly familiar, and even through the well-assumed voice he recognized the royal tones. It struck him all at once, and with it the fact of Leoline's increased danger. Count L'Etrange was a formidable rival, but King Charles of England was even more formidable. Thought is quick, quicker than the electric telegraph or balloon travelling, and in two seconds the whole stated things, with all the attendant surprises and dangers, danced before his mind's eye like a panorama, and he comprehended the past, the present, and the future before Hubert had uttered the last word of his whisper. He turned his eyes with a very new and singular sensation upon the quondam count, and found that gentleman looking very hard at him, with a prenaturally grave expression of countenance. Sir Norman knew well as anybody the varying moods of his royal countship, and notwithstanding his general good nature, it was not safe to trifle with him at all times so he repressed every outward sign of emotion whatever and resolved to treat him as count l'etrange until he should choose to sail under his own proper colours well said the count with unruffled eagerness and so you decline to go any further sir norman hubert's eyes was fixed with a warning glance upon him and sir norman composedly answered no, Count, I do not absolutely decline, but before I do go any further, I should like to know by what right do you bring all these men here, and what are your intentions in so doing? And if I refuse to answer, then I refuse to move a step further in the business, said Sir Norman, with decision. And why, my good friend, you surely can have no objection to anything that can be done against highwaymen and cutthroats. Right, I have no objections, but others may. Whom do you mean by others? The king, for instance. His gracious majesty is whimsical at times, and who knows that he may take it into his royal head to involve us somehow with them. I know the adage, put not your trust in princes. Very good, said the count, with a slight and irrepressible smile. Your prudence is beyond all praise but I think in this matter I may safely promise to stand between you and the king's wrath. Look at those horsemen beyond you, and see if they do not wear the uniform of his majesty's own bodyguard. Sir Norman looked and saw the dazzling of their splendid equipments glancing and glistening in the moonbeams. I see. Then you have the royal permission for all this? You have said it. Now, most scrupulous of men, proceed. "'Look here!' exclaimed Hubert, suddenly pointing to a corner of the rain. "'Someone has seen us, and is going to give the alarm.' "'He shall miss it, though,' said Sir Norman, detecting at the same instant a dark figure, getting through the broken doorway, and striking spurs into his horse. 
He was instantaneously beside it, out of the saddle, and had grasped the retreater by the shoulder. "'By your leave!' exclaimed Sir Norman. "'Not quite so fast. Stand out here in the moonlight until I see who you are.' "'Let me go!' cried the man, grappling with his opponent. "'I know who you are, and I swear you'll never see moonlight or sunlight again if you do not instantly let me go!' Sir Norman recognized the voice with a perfect shout of delight. The Duke, by all that's lucky! Oh, I'll let you go, but not until the hangman gets hold of you. Villain and robber, you shall pay for your misdeeds now. Hold! shouted the commanding voice of Count L'Etrange. See, Sir Norman Kingsley, there is no time, and this is no person for you to scoff with. He is our prisoner, and shall show us the nearest way into this den of thieves. Give me your sword, fellow, and be thankful I do not make you shorter by a head with it. You do not know him, cried Sir Norman, in vivid excitement. I tell you, this is the identical scoundrel who attempted to rob and murder you a few hours ago. So much the better. He shall pay for that, and all his other shortcomings, before long. But in the meantime I order him to bring us before the rest of this outlawed crew. I shall do nothing of the kind, said the duke sullenly. Just as you please. Here, my men, two of you take hold of this scoundrel and dispatch him at once. The guard had all dismounted, and two of them came forward with edifying obedience to do as they were told. The effect upon the duke was miraculous. Instantly he started up with an energy perfectly amazing. No, 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 I'll do it. Come this way, gentlemen, and I'll bring you direct into their midst. Oh, good Lord, whatever will become of us? This last frantic question was addressed to society in general, but Sir Norman felt called upon to answer. That's very easily told, my man. If you and the rest of your titled associates receive your deserts, as there is no doubt you will, from the gracious hand of our sovereign lord the king. The strongest rope and high scallows at Tyburn will be your elevated destiny. The duke groaned dismally, and would have come to a halt to beg mercy on the spot, had not Hubert given him a probe in the ribs with the point of his dagger, that sent him on again with a distracted howl. "'Why, this is perfect, Hades,' said the Count, as he stumbled after in the darkness. "'Are you sure we are going right, Kingsley?' The inquiry was not unnatural, for the blackness was perfectly Tartarian, and the soldiers behind were knocking their tall shins against all sorts of obstacles, as they grouped blindly along, invoking from them countless curses, not loud but deep. "'I don't know whether we are or not,' said Sir Norman significantly. Only God help him if we're not. Where are you taking us to, you black-looking bandit? I give you my word of honor, gentlemen, said an imploring voice in the darkness, that I am leading you by the nearest way to the midnight court. All I ask of you in return is that you will let me enter before you, for if they find that I lead you in, my life will not be worth a moment's purchase. As if it ever was worth it said sir norman contemptuously on with you and be thankful i don't save your companions the trouble by making an end of you where you stand rush along old fellow suggested hubert giving him another poke with his dagger that drew forth a second doleful howl notwithstanding the darkness sir norman discovered that they were being led in a direction exactly opposite that by which he had previously effected an entrance they were in the vault, he knew, by the darkness, though they had descended no staircase, and he was just wondering if their guide was not meditating some treachery by such a circuitous route, when suddenly a tumult of voices and uproar and confusion met his ear. At the same instant their guide opened a door, revealing a dark passage, illuminated by a few rays of light, and which Sir Norman instantly recognized as that leading to the black chamber. Here again the duke paused, and turned round to them with a wild imploring face. Gentlemen, I do conjure you to let me enter before you do. I tell you, they will murder me the very instant they discover I have led you here. 
"'That would be a great pity,' said the Count. "'And the gallows will be cheated of one of its brightest ornaments. "'That is your den of thieves, I suppose, from which all this uproar comes?' "'It is. And as I have guided you safely to it, surely I deserve it this trifling boon.' "'Trifling, do you call it?' interposed Sir Norman to let you make your escape, as you most assuredly will do, the moment you are out of our sight. No, no, we are two old birds to be caught with such chaff. And though the informer always get off scot-free, your service deserve no such boon, for we could have found our way without your help. On with you, Sir Robber, and if your companions do kill you, console yourself with the thought that they have only anticipated the executioner by a few days. With a perfectly heart-rending groan, the unfortunate duke walked on, but when they reached the archway directly before the room, he came to an obstinate halt, and positively refused to go a step farther. It was death anyway, and he resisted with the courage of desperation feeling he might as well die there as go in and be assassinated by his confederates and not even the persuasive influence of hubert stagger could prevail on him to budge an inch farther stay then said the count with perfect indifference and soldiers see that he does not escape now kingsley let us just have a glimpse of what is going on within Though the party had made considerable noise in advancing, and he had spoken quite loudly in their little animated discussion with the duke, so great was the turmoil and confusion within, that it was not heeded or even heard. With very different feelings from those which he had stood there last, Sir Norman stepped forward and stood beside the Count, looking at the scene within. The crimson court was in a state of most admired disorder, and the confusion of tongues was equal to Babel. No longer were they languidly promenading or lolling in the cushioned chairs, but all seemed running to and fro in the wildest excitement, which the grandest duke among them seemed to share equally with the terrified white sylphs. Everybody appeared to be talking together, and paying no attention whatever to the sentiments of their neighbours. One universal centre of union alone seemed to exist, and that was the green judicial table near the throne, upon which, while all tongues ran, all eyes turned. For some minutes neither of the beholders could make out why, owing to the crowd, principally of the ladies, pressing around it. But Sir Norman guessed, and thrilled through with a vague sensation of terror, lest it should prove to be the dead body of Miranda. Skipping in and out among the females, he saw the dwarf performing a sort of war-dance of rage and frenzy, twining both hands in his wig, as if he would have torn it out by the roots, and anon tearing at somebody else's wig, so that everybody backed off when he came near them. "'Who is that little fiend?' inquired the Count. "'And what have they got there at the end of the room, pray?' "'That little fiend is the ringleader here, and is entitled Prince Caliban. "'Regarding your other question,' said Sir Norman, with a faint thrill, "'there was a table there when I saw it last, but I'm afraid there is something worse now.' "'Could ever any mortal conceive of such a scene?' observed the Count to himself. Look at that little picture of ugliness, how he hops about like a dropsical bullfrog. Some of those women are very pretty, too, and outshine more than one court beauty that I have seen. Upon my word, it is the most extraordinary spectacle I have ever heard of. I wonder what they've got that's so attractive down there. At the same moment a loud voice within the circle abruptly exclaimed, she revives she revives back back and give her air instantly the throng swayed and fell back and the dwarf with a sort of yell whether of rage or relief nobody knew swept them from side to side with a wave of his long arms and cleared a wide vacancy for his own especial benefit the action gave the count an opportunity of gratifying his curiosity the object of attraction was now plainly visible. Sir Norman's surmises had been correct. 
the green table of the parliament house of the midnight court had been converted by the aid of cushions and pillows into an extempore couch and half buried in their downy depths lay miranda the queen the sweeping robe of royal purple trimmed with ermine the circlets of jewels on arms bosom and head she still wore and the beautiful face was whiter than fallen snow yet she was not dead as sir norman had dreaded for the dark eyes were open and were fixed with an unutterable depth of melancholy or vacancy her arms lay helplessly by her side and some one the court physician probably was bending over her and feeling her pulse as the count's eyes fell upon her he started back and grasped sir norman's arm with consternation good heavens kingsley he cried it's leoline herself in his excitement he had spoken so loud that in the momentary silence that followed the physician's direction his voice had rung through the room and drew every eye upon them we are seen we are seen shouted hubert and as he spoke a terrible cry idled the room in an instant every sword leaped from its scabbard and the shriek of the startled women rang appallingly out on the air sir norman drew his sword too but the count with his eyes yet fixed on miranda still held him by the arm and excitedly exclaimed tell me tell me is it leoline leoline no how could it be leoline they look alike that's all draw your sword count and defend yourself we are discovered and they are upon us we are upon them you mean and it is they who are discovered said the count doing as directed and stepping boldly in a pretty hornet's nest is this we have lit upon if ever there was one side by side with the count with a dauntless step and i sir norman entered too and at sight of him a burst of surprise and fury rang from lip to lip there was a yell of betrayed betrayed and the dwarf with a face so distorted by fiendish fury that it was scarcely human made a frenzied rush at him when the clear commanding voice of the count rang like a bugle blast through the assembly sheath your swords the whole of you and yield yourselves prisoners in the king's name i command you to surrender there is no king here but i screamed the dwarf gnashing his teeth and fairly foaming with rage die traitor and spy you have escaped me once but your hour is come now allow me to differ from you said sir norman politely as he evaded the blindly frantic lung of the dwarf's sword and inserted an inch or two of the point of his own in that enraged little prince's anatomy so far from my hour having come if you will take the trouble to reflect upon it you will find it is the reverse and that my little friend's brief and brilliant career is rapidly drawing to a close at these bland remarks and at the sharp thrust that accompanied them the dwarf's previous war dance of anxiety was nothing to the hornpipe of exasperation he went through when sir norman ceased the blood was raining from his side and from the point of his adversary's sword as he withdrew it and maddened like a wild beast at the sight of his own blood he screeched and foamed and kicked about his stout little legs and gnashed his teeth and made grabs at his wig and lashed the air with his sword and made such desperate pokes with it at sir norman and everybody else who came in his way that for the public good the young knight ran him through the sword-arm and in spite of all his distracted dedos captured him by the help of hubert and passed him over to the soldiers to cheer and keep company with the duke this brisk little affair being over sir norman had time to look about him it had all passed in so short a space and the dwarf had been so desperately frantic that the rest had paused involuntarily and were still looking on missing the count he glanced around the room and discovered him standing on miranda's throne looking over the company with the cool air of a conqueror miranda aroused as she very well might be by all this screaming and fighting had partly raised herself upon her elbow and was looking wildly about her as her eye fell on sir norman she sat fairly erect with a cry of exultation and joy you have come you have come as i knew you would 
she excitedly cried, and the hour of retribution is at hand. At the words of one who a few moments before they had supposed to be dead, an awe-struck silence fell, and the Count, taking advantage of it, waved his hand and cried, Yield yourselves, prisoners, I command you. The royal guards are without, and the first of you who offers the slightest resistance will die like a dog. Ho, guards, enter and seize your prisoners. Quick as thought the room was full of soldiers, but the rest of the order was easier said than obeyed. The robbers, knowing their doom was death, fought with the fury of desperation, and a short, wild, and terrible conflict ensued. Foremost in the melee was Sir Norman and the Count, while Hubert, who had taken possession of the dwarf's sword, fought like a young lion. The shrieks of the women were heart-rending, as they all fled precipitately into the blue dining-room, and crouching in corners or flying distractedly about, true to their sex, made the air resound with the most lamentable cries. Some five or six braver than the rest alone remained and more than one of these actually mixed in the affray, with a heroism worthy a better cause. Miranda, still sitting erect and supported in the arms of a kneeling and trembling sylph in white, watched the conflict with terribly exultant eyes that blazed brighter and brighter with a lurid fire of vengeful joy at every robber that fell. "'Oh, that I were strong enough to wield a sword!' was her fierce aspiration at every instant. If I could only mix in that battle for five minutes, I could die with a happy heart. Had she been able to wield a sword for five minutes according to her wish, she would probably have wielded it from beginning to end of the battle, for it did not last much longer than that. The robbers fought with fury and ferocity, but they had been taken by surprise and were overpowered by numbers and obliged to yield. The crimson court was indeed crimson now, for the velvet carpeting was dyed a more terrible red, and was slippery with a rain of blood. A score of dead and dying lay groaning on the ground, and the rest beaten and bloody gave up their swords and surrendered. "'You should have done this at first, said the Count, coolly wiping his blood-stained weapon, and replacing it in its sheath and by so doing saved some time and more bloodshed. Where are all the fair ladies, Kingsley, I saw here, when we entered first? They fled like a flock of frightened deer, said Hubert, taking it upon himself to answer, through yonder archway when the fight commenced. I will go in search of them if you like. I'm rather at a loss what to do with them, said the Count, half laughing. It would be a pity to bring such a cavalcade of pretty women into the city to die of the plague. Can you suggest nothing, Sir Norman? Nothing but to leave them here, to take care of themselves, or let them go free. They would be a great addition to the court at Whitehall, suggested Hubert, in his prettiest tone, and a thousand times handsomer than half the damsels therein. There, for instance, is one a dozen times or more beautiful than Mr. Stuart herself. Leaning in his nonchalant way on the hilt of his sword, he pointed to Miranda, whose fiercely joyful eyes were fixed with a glance that made the three of them shudder on the bloody floor and the heap of slain. "'Who is that?' asked the Count curiously. "'Why is she perched up there, and why does she bear such an extraordinary resemblance to Leoline? Do you know anything about her, Kingsley?' I know she is the wife of that unlovely little man whose howls in yonder passage you can hear, if you listen, and that she was the queen of this midnight court, and is wounded, if not dying now. I never saw such fierce eyes before in a female head. One would think she fell exalted in this wholesale slaughter of her subjects. So she does, and she hates both her husband and her subjects, with an intensity you cannot conceive. How very like royalty, observed Hubert in parenthesis. If she were a real queen, she could not act more naturally. Sir Norman smiled, and the Count glanced at the audacious page suspiciously. But Hubert's face was touching to whiteness in its innocent unconsciousness. Miranda, looking up at the same time, caught the young knight's eye, 
and made a motion for him to approach she held out both her hands to him as he came near with the same look of dreadful delight sir norman kingsley i am dying and my last words are in thanksgiving to you for having thus avenged me let me hope you have many days to live yet fair lady said sir norman with the same feeling of repulsion he had experienced in the dungeon i am sorry you have been obliged to witness this terrible scene sorry she cried fiercely why since the first hour i remember it all i remember nothing that has given me such joy as what has passed now my only regret is that i did not see them all die before my eyes sorry i tell you i would not have missed it for ten thousand worlds madam you must not talk like this said sir norman almost sternly heaven forbid there should exist a woman who could rejoice in bloodshed and death you don't i know you wrong yourself and your own nature in saying so be calm now do not excite yourself you shall come with us and be properly cared for and i feel certain you have a long and happy life before you yet who are those men she said not heeding him and who ah great heaven what is that in looking round she had met hubert face to face she knew that that face was her own and with a horror stamped on every feature that no words can depict she fell back with a terrible scream and was dead sir norman was so shocked by the suddenness of the last catastrophe that for some time he could not realize that she had actually expired until he bent over her and placed his ear to her lips no breath was there no pulse stirred in that fierce heart the midnight queen was indeed dead oh this is fearful exclaimed sir norman pale and horrified the sight of hubert and his wonderful resemblance to her has completed what her wound and this excitement began her last is breathed on earth peace be with her said the count removing his hat which up to the present he had worn and now sir norman if we are to keep our engagement at sunrise we had better be on the move for unless i am greatly mistaken the sky is already grey with day dawn what are your commands asked sir norman turning away with a sigh from the beautiful form already stiffening in death that you come with me to seek out those frightened fair ones who are a great deal too lovely to share the fate of their male companions i shall give them their liberty to go wherever they please on condition that they do not enter the city we have enough vile of their class there already sir norman silently followed him into the azure and silver saloon where the crowd of duchesses and countesses were weeping and wringing their hands and as white as so many pretty ghosts in a somewhat brief and forcible manner considering his characteristic gallantry the count made his proposal which with feelings of pleasure and relief was at once acceded to and the two gentlemen bowed themselves out and left the startled ladies on returning to the crimson court he commanded a number of his soldiers to remain and bury the dead and assist the wounded and then followed by the remainder and the prisoners under their charge passed out and were soon from the heated atmosphere in the cool morning air the moon was still serenely shining but the stars that kept the earliest hours were setting and the eastern sky was growing light with the hazy grey of coming morn i told you day dawn was at hand said the count as he sprang into his saddle and lo in the sky it is grey already it is time for it said sir norman as he too got into his seat this has been the longest night i have ever known and the most eventful one of my life and the end is not yet leoline waits to decide between us sir norman shrugged his shoulders true but i have little doubt what the decision will be i presume you will have to deliver up your prisoners before you can visit her and i will avail myself of the opportunity to snatch a few moments to fulfil a melancholy duty of my own as you please i have no objection but in that case you will need some one to guide you to the place of rendezvous 
so I will order my private attendant, yonder, to keep you in sight and guide you to me when your business is ended. The Count had given the order to start the moment they had left the ruin, and the conversation had been carried on while riding at breakneck gallop. Sir Norman thanked him for his offer, and they rode in silence until they reached the city and their paths diverged, Sir Norman's leading to the apothecary's shop where he had left Ormiston, and the Count's leading he best knew where. George, the attendant referred to, joined the knight, and leaving his horse in his care, Sir Norman entered the shop, and encountered the spectral proprietor at the door. "'What of my friend?' was his eager inquiry. "'Has he yet shown signs of returning consciousness?' "'Alas, no,' replied the apothecary with a groan, that came wailing up like a whistle. "'He was so excessively dead that there was no use keeping him.' and as the room was wanted for other purposes i pray my dear sir don't look so violent i put him in the pest cart and had him buried in the plague pit shouted sir norman making a spring at him but the man darted off like a ghostly flash into the inner room and closed and bolted the door in a twinkling sir norman kicked at it spitefully but it resisted his every effort and overcoming a strong temptation to smash every bottle in the shop, he sprang once more into the saddle and rode off to the plague pit. It was the second time within the last twelve hours he had stood there, and on the previous occasion he who now lay in it had stood by his side. He looked down, sickened and horror-struck. Perhaps before another morning he too might be there, and, feeling his blood run cold at the thought, he was turning away, when someone came rapidly up and sank down with a moaning, gasping cry on its very edge. That shape, tall and slender and graceful, he well knew, and leaning over her, he laid his hand on her shoulder and exclaimed, La Masque! End of chapter 20 Read by Lars Rolander